very much for showing up this afternoon for what is going to be a very historic event. You may not know this, but my name is Joanne Bowman, and it is my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. We want to start off by also thanking the listening audience of KBOO FM radio station, and we want to thank uh, Portland Cable Access for also uh, uh, broadcasting this telecast live. We also want to really appreciate all the incredible media partners in this community that came together to create what will be the historic event that you're about to participate in. It is my pleasure at this moment to introduce to you Russell Newman. He's a program manager with Free Press, and he's here to explain how this event came about. And since he just came from a similar event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, I think he's got some experience in that. So please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Russell Newman. Welcome, indeed. My name is Russell Newman, Program Manager for Free Press. And I am thrilled at 5.30 in the afternoon as people are getting off work to see this many people here already to talk about an issue that for a long time, and not even so long ago, was considered too esoteric, too complicated for the public to understand. I mean, if there's one thing 2003 showed me, it was that. That was the year the public proved beyond a doubt that not only did they understand the issue, but they had a lot of stands on the issue, and it actually is an issue that is at the forefront of their minds. I had a pretty remarkable experience at the airport in New England as I was flying into Albuquerque uh, two days ago for last night's meeting. I was standing in front of a woman who was in her late 70s and we got to talking. And it, I, it came out, I, was com I told her I was coming out to Albuquerque and Portland to help conduct a couple meetings on media policy and media consolidation. And usually when you say stuff like that, you have, to, you have about three minutes of obligatory explanation you have to give at that point. I didn't even get around to that. The moment the words media consolidation came out of my mouth, she put down her bags, started shaking her arms, and said, I don't know how Michael Powell can do it. He does in good conscience. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is remarkable because not only did she have an opinion on this subject, but how many of you, even a year ago, could have named the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission off the top of your head like that? <laughs> <laughs> Those were raising their hands. I'm very proud of you. It's terrific. Now, your timing on getting involved in this issue is terrific because for the first time, to my recollection anyway, we have not one but two commissioners in the Federal Communications Commission that not only care what those of you out there have to say, <laughs> but they're willing to fly across the country to hear what you have to say firsthand. We're honored to have Mr. Cops and Mr. Michael, Michael Cops and Jonathan Adelstein with us this evening. Indeed, last year, millions of citizens wrote Congress, wrote the FCC, called their congressperson after, in a contentious three to two vote, the FCC passed new media ownership rules that were much looser than what we had before. And we actually have great reason to celebrate this evening because today the courts agree with the citizens and our two dissenters who are with us this evening. Basically, we're sending those rules back to the FCC for a rewrite. <laughs> but the courts are essentially saying, our nice try, Chairman Powell, try again. Now, while your timing is good, it's also critical, because in addition to needing to deal with these rules again, other rules are being considered by Congress over the course of the next year that are going to determine much more than just who owns your radio, TV, and newspapers. They're going to determine much more who has control and what this control will mean for the wires and the airwaves themselves through which all channels reach citizens and all data and how you all communicate with each other. So if you're new to this issue, I hope tonight becomes a beginning and not an end of your involvement, because when I see crowds like this, uh, it gives me great confidence that when the new rules are being rewritten or written in the first place, those who think that it's gonna happen quietly and under the radar are in for a really big surprise, and I'm holding you to that. <laughs> and in fact, there's even better reason to be optimistic because everywhere I've gone, I've seen a similar crowd like this when we come out to talk about such an issue. It's, it's amazing because our press seems to underreport these kinds of things, uh, which is really strange because this is one of the most vital things our democracy needs. Citizens coming out for an evening to talk about an issue that is dear to their hearts, an issue that they realize, uh, no matter what issue they care about, a cleaner environment, uh, health care, social and economic, economic justice, 
you all realize that without a media that represents your views, you'll achieve nothing. So just in case tomorrow's papers don't trumpet what happened today, now might be a good time to let the folks in downtown Portland know how many are here at 5.30 this evening <laughs> to discuss media policy. Let them know. <laughs> let them know. <laughs> Get them in off the streets. <laughs> yeah. There's never been a more important time for you to declare your vision for how your media should look. That's why tonight we have put together two terrific panels to provide food for thought. But more importantly, in between these panels is the opportunity for you to express yourself how your media are serving you. And if indeed you are interested in testifying this evening, I would request that you, there is a pad out in the lobby that you should sign up on. Because uh, once we enter, uh, the open mic period will be calling on you individually. Uh, and in the course of the evening, if during one of the panels the bard suddenly strikes, you should not feel shy about asking your neighbor to stand up and let you go, to sign up on the panels because this is not a movie. This is a town meeting and it demands your involvement. <laughs> and I encourage you to become more involved. Uh, before we move on, I, there's a number of people I definitely have to thank for the success of this evening. Uh, any success of this evening really correctly gets credited to uh, those we worked with here on the ground, especially the City Club of Portland, the uh, Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, the Money and Politics Research Action Project, the American Federation of Musicians Local 99, the Communications Workers of America Local 7901, and Jobs with Justice. I mean, these are all groups that really, right from the very get-go, saw the need for this kind of meeting and really made it happen. So my thanks really goes out to them. This is fantastic. <laughs> So this is your meeting, Portland, and to ensure this remains so, I'm going to step away from the mic, reintroduce Joanne, and I think I speak for all of us when I say we really look forward to hearing everything you have to tell us. Thanks very much for coming out, everyone. Thank you so much, Russ. We really appreciate your leadership in this effort. It is my honor to introduce to you at this time, City Commissioner Eric Sten. You may know that City Commissioner Eric Sten was a leader in this community about open access to the airways and media. And so we really appreciate him being here to do some words of welcome this evening. Commissioner Sten. Uh, well, well, thank you, Joanne. It's, it's really, really terrific to stand up here. I wish you could all just shuffle through here and stand up real quickly and take a look at yourselves. It's delightful to see you all for two reasons. One is I think this is absolutely critical issues. It's almost, I think it's almost never that we've had two FCC commissioners in Portland here to talk about issues. It's unprecedented and frankly it bucks the trend of what's going on in DC and at the FCC to make rules, I think, without proper public input. So to show that when they come out people actually care about this is absolutely remarkable. I'm also happy because I got to meet these uh, uh, wonderful two gentlemen beforehand and I told them there's gonna be a lot of people here and I would have felt really silly if there wasn't so I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad there is and there's a lot more coming in they don't realize to get into an event like this in Portland you have to sign at least 10 petitions before you can come in so you really have to come about 15 minutes early and able to in order to get in um, really my job is on your behalf and on our city councils to welcome commissioners cops and Adelstein to Portland it really is remarkable we're very glad they're here and I want to get to the panel and as I do I just wanted to share with them a couple of things that I think maybe, maybe they'll hear tonight in the town hall. This is a city that cares a lot about alternative media. We have radio stations, cable access. I think we have the strongest cable franchise in the country. I think you ought to... Yeah. I hope you will fight to give us even more authority and we'll have a stronger franchise. Uh, we do everything we can under federal law and we ought to get some more. And what you'll see is people care a ton about localism, about diversity. We're trying to get more Wi-Fi. We're trying to get more things that make media accessible. And our concern is not that, that the big media not have a place in this world, but that it not be the only place. And that it be free and open access to everyone who, who, who has something to say, which you can see is just about everybody here. Um, we, we were the jurisdiction uh, five, six years ago who required the local cable company to have open access on their internet lines. I think that was incredible important. I think the way the internet is wired actually has to do with fundamental free speech and that if you don't require open access and still believe it's something you'll hear about tonight that the FCC needs to help us with. We actually won that in federal court if all of you remember that and then lost it upon, upon appeal but that, that loss I think actually led to some later court decisions that were in the right, right way to go and we still have a very very long way to go to have open access on the internet and if you don't require open access on the internet 
it eventually doesn't become a free medium. It almost, medium, it almost gets hardwired the wrong way. So we urge, that's right, uh, we, 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 um, we really urge you to keep public interest alive and we really hope that we can be one more voice in joining the, these, I think, courageous FCC commissioners who have been on the right side of these issues in saying that this rhetoric about doing nothing really is not true. You're doing harm when you do nothing, and it's time to do something for the public good. And I hope you'll help me in welcoming them here with that start to this robust evening. Thank you so much, commissioners, for coming out here. Commissioner Sten was absolutely right when he talked about the courageousness of the commissioners that are on this stage. And before I go into the bio introductions, I would be really appreciative if Oregonians would stand up and show them how much we appreciate having our voice heard on that commission. Thank you so much. That's a little taste of Oregonians' appreciation. It is my real pleasure to introduce Commissioner Mike Copps. Mike Copps has served as the Commissioner since 2001. Prior to this post, Commissioner Copps served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Trade Development at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he was previously Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Basic Industries. Mr. Copps came to Washington in 1970, joining the staff of Senator Ernest Hollings as Chief of Staff. He has also held positions at Collins and Ackerman, Ackman Corporation and the American Meat Institute. Before coming to Washington, Copps was a professor of U.S. history at Loyola University of the South. Please welcome Commissioner Copps to the podium. <laughs> I do believe Jonathan and I have found a home. <laughs> we are glad to be here. We're delighted to be here. It would be even better if we had five of us here. Maybe even two Michael Powells. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who worked to make this night happen. I see a lot of friends out in this uh, audience who have already gone to extraordinary lengths in the battle to bring media democracy to the United States of America. Thanks to them. Thanks to all the good citizens who have come out tonight. I love coming out to the Pacific Northwest because people here really take their public interest seriously. And uh, Eric, I think, set the, uh, set the standard in talking about the public interest, keep the public interest alive. That's what this is all about. And this is a wonderful night for many reasons. Earlier today, as you've already heard, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals told the FCC and told the country that the commission got it wrong, mightily wrong, when it loosened media consolidation rules last June and to go back to the drawing boards and try to do a better job next time, get serious about it and do it right. That's wonderful. That makes this evening good. Earlier this week, And earlier this week, the United States Senate, for the second time, said let's go get rid of all of these new rules and go back to the status quo before June 2nd of last year, toss them all overboard, get rid of them, and your House of Representatives would vote the same way, I am convinced, tomorrow morning if the House leadership would let them have the right to vote. So we're making progress. The majority that argued that, oh, it knew best, just leave it to us and we'll show you how to get a rules set through the uh, courts. You guys don't know how to do, how to draft rules. The majority that uh, said it had utter faith that big media was good for America, that a free market existed in the media and we would all be better served in the public interest, protected just by hands off of the people's airwaves, if they even acknowledge they were the people's airwaves, I don't know. But they've now been embarrassed and they've now been set back. And that's cause for celebration, so tonight we should do some celebration. But let me tell you this, it's not a night for complacency, it's a night for 
commitment. Because what happened today, good as it is, is that the court sent this back to the very same FCC from whence it came and instructed those very same people to do it again. And there's no guarantee, believe you me, that we're going to do it right next time unless, unless you and I and all like-minded citizens around this country roll up our sleeves and vow to put even more into this in the next six to nine months than we have in the past. And that's asking a lot, but I think it's something we need to do, and each and every one of us has a civic responsibility to do no less than that. I think this is a golden opportunity. This might be the best chance we have in a generation to finally wrap ourselves, wrap our arms around this issue of how many, or rather how few, corporate interests are going to be able to control media in the United States of America, and what are we going to do to bring back localism and diversity and competition, and to move from where we are towards more democracy in U.S. media. So I'm optimistic tonight. I really am. I don't underestimate the lobbying that's going to be issuing from the other side, the money that's going to be spent to try to encourage a similar result to the one we had last June 2nd. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got serious odds and we have a, a commission whose mindset is, uh, is the other way when it comes to the future of media and when it comes to the whole question of exercising some oversight in behalf of the public interest. So it's, uh, it's a steep curve. But you already have accomplished so much when you stop and think about it. The court action today comes because you folks in this audience and folks around America, liberals and conservative, Republicans as well as Democrats, young and old, north and south and east and west, all united in a common cause with real grassroots strength and took that cause and let your decision makers know what was important to you. I can't tell you how many members of uh, Congress I talked to uh, after they came home last year and said, gee, we never heard about these media issues before and that's all that people want to talk about back home is media consolidation and concentration. So you made tremendous uh, progress. And by the way, one person who has really helped us make that progress is your distinguished U.S. Senator Ron Wyden, who is an admirable, <laughs> who is a wonderful representative uh, for this area and, and a man of, of really uh, clear and consistent intellect and good judgment. And we rely on, on Ron and his uh, staff uh, uh, a lot. So you, uh, you've accomplished a lot already in getting that message to Congress. You took it to court. This coalition took it to court together. And now the challenge is to keep it alive. I think this court decision today helps bring it front and center again. I think even the media today, just from talking to the, uh, uh, the press uh, this afternoon after I got in here, now realizes this issue hasn't gone away, hasn't suddenly uh, faded into obscurity, but it's back. And it's back at a very good time. I mean, this is a time of year and election season when people, uh, people are more willing maybe to discuss these things than even before. So let's, uh, let's really roll up our sleeves. Let's, let's recommit and see if we can't uh, bring this media democracy fight of ours home. We made wonderful progress, but we've got a long way to go. But when you stop and think about the stakes for our civic dialogue, for the future of our country, uh, Everybody likes to think, I suppose, that the issues they work on are of, of such transcendent importance, but I really can't think of any domestic issue that exceeds this one importance. When you stop and think about it, we're talking about the way we communicate with each other over and above just our personal interchanges, how, how we communicate, how we uh, entertain, how we have a civic dialogue, how we make our decisions, and God knows the public policy uh, questions before the United States of America today are so, uh, so serious and so profound that we're not giving them the, uh, the attention they could. But I tell you this, if we're successful in this battle, all of those issues will be much better treated by the American people going forward. So thank you for everything you've done. I'm delighted to be out here tonight to, to learn more Every time we go to one of these hearings, we take back uh, such good information. Somebody said to me today, a reporter, well, how many of these things are you going to do? Are you just bring back all of this anecdotal information? I said, I can tell you every meeting I have gone to, 
I talk to people who are experiencing firsthand the media in their communities, who know the score, who know what happens when consolidated media companies come in, know what happens to the newsroom and that, and on those stations, know what happens to the quality of entertainment. This is exactly what we need to be doing, and today I've called upon Chairman Powell to get out in the country and do the kind of hearings Commissioner Adelstein and I did last year with all five commissioners and do six or eight or ten of these in the next uh, several months, a massive record, do some independent studies and then make a decision like it should have been made in the first place on behalf of the people of the United States. Thank you so much, Commissioner Cobbs. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner um, Alderstein. Uh, Jonathan Alderstein was sworn in as a member of the Federal Communications Commission on December 3rd, 2002. Before joining the FCC, Alderstein served for 15 years as a staff member in the U.S. Senate. For the past seven years, he has been a senior legislative aide to U.S. Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle, where he advised Senator Daschle on telecommunications, financial services, transportation, and other key issues. Prior to his service in the Senate, Edelstein held a number of academic positions at Harvard University and Stanford University. Please give Commissioner Alderstein a warm welcome, please. Okay, well, one thing you forgot to mention was that I spent a couple years at Lewis and Clark College right here in Portland, Oregon. And let me tell you, it is great to be back in Portland. I love it here, too. I actually learned to love the rain when I was here. Because uh, it makes everything so green and beautiful. And the people here are so, are so rich as well in, in their, their knowledge and their commitment to public interest, as, as my colleague has said. And Mike Hopps has been such a leader in this effort. He deserves another round of applause for the victory that he led us to today. You know, when we scheduled this, we had no idea this would be such an historic day in the history of the fight for media democracy. And we never thought that it would turn into the victory celebration that it is indeed. It's uh, so great to share it, I think, with, uh, with the leader in this fight, Mike Hopps, and especially uh, with all of you, the concerned citizens who, after all, are the beneficiaries of today's court decision. Of course, it's also nice to spend it with Michael Powell. <laughs> we'll take whichever one we can get. <laughs> but this huge victory that we're talking about today is really a tribute to the efforts by so many of you in this room and by so many of the organizers of tonight's event. Your voices, your outrage that you expressed over this decision is what gave us power we could feel the reverberations in Washington as the postcards and letters and emails mounted and the discussions with members of Congress rose in their pitch as the FCC was going totally in the wrong direction and people were desperate to find a way to stop it and feeling hopeless and feeling that there was nothing they could do against this onslaught by big media and its advocates on the FCC. Well, you proved them all wrong. We won today. We won the biggest, most sweeping victory we could have ever dreamed of when we started this in the sort of the back of our car, going from city to city, trying to scrape it together. And tonight, we're giving you another chance to express your views on this historic day. And there's so much to do now. We have to translate this enormous court victory into better rules, into getting it right this time. The courts and the Congress have told us we need to fix this. The irony of all that is, I remember back when uh, we were asked to testify on June 5th, three days after the decision was made, and my colleagues who voted for this said, oh, Congress made me do it. Oh, the courts made me do it. Well, now they've been reversed by the courts and they've been reversed by Congress and they have no excuse left but to do the right thing. As, as Commissioner Copps noted, Congress just this week voted 99 to 1 to put these rules on ice. And Ron Wyden was indeed a great leader in that fight the whole way. You, you owe him a great debt of gratitude. He fights for you every day in Washington. And you can never let up the pressure. We are certainly not going to rest on our laurels here. We can't. But the efforts that we've made have gotten us this far. We've got the momentum, and now we've got to get across the goal line. 
we've got to get these real rules in place that actually address the needs of people to get a diversity of viewpoints, to have their local concerns addressed, and to have a competition of viewpoints among your media outlets. Before anyone bothered to come to Portland and ask you for your views on things, the FCC in that June decision approved the most sweeping and destructive rollback of media protection rules in the history of American broadcasting. Well, we're here now, and I bet you have a message for those who ignored you that they better not do it again. <laughs> Commissioner Copps and I, I think, used to feel like lone voices in the wilderness as we went to some of these hearings, and we did feel a good outpouring of public support, but the media never showed up, and we were kind of doing it, you know, by the... <laughs> But out of our own out of our own pockets and trying to do what we could just to scrape by but what a difference a year can make what a complete transformation of the landscape thanks to free press and the other organizers of this event thanks to all the noise that you made last year i went to albuquerque last night to do a similar town hall meeting commissioner cops had urgent business he had to do back in washington but we kind of split these things up sometimes he goes to one and sometimes i go to one and we love it when we go to one together like this but as, last night in Albuquerque, the people were eloquent. 100, 150 went, and we went till late at night. They were passionate. They were educated. They have so much more insight than the people that we hear from every day inside the Beltway. <laughs> I, I just wish that all of our colleagues could go with us, because they would never make the decisions they made if they could hear from you the wisdom that you have. If they could be here with us tonight, they would think twice. And I warned them about it. I went around the country with Commissioner Copps, and we heard this torrent of outpouring of concern. And I said to them, I said, there's a powder keg of public anger that's about to explode. And I said this publicly. And people said, oh, Adelstein's exaggerating. Oh, he's blowing this thing out of proportion. There he goes. Nobody's questioning that anymore. <laughs> you know, they got their chance. And now it's our chance to get this right. They should have done it right in the first place. They should have made you part of the debate. It's about you, after all. It's your airwaves. They belong to the public, and you are the ones who should tell us how to get it right. What's in your interest? That's not just the right thing to do. That's the law. The statutory standard is that we are supposed to make sure that the airwaves are used in the public interest. Your airwaves, not in the interest of those who seek to profit by using your airwaves. And that feeling is shared by everybody across the spectrum, from right to left, and virtually everybody in the middle. Their outrage came from Republicans and Democrats. The buzz came into Washington and it turned into a real roar. And the whole opportunity now for a new bipartisan effort to undo the damage that could have been done by those decisions is one that uh, is, is, is better than we could have ever dreamed. But to really continue this effort, we do need that grassroots effort to continue. We need to keep this at the top of the agenda. Because you can bet that the media is not going to do it for us. And last night, that's right. Last, last night in Albuquerque, you know, we woke up this morning and there, you know, was a little tiny story kind of buried back in the business section somewhere, or in the local section with a little paragraph or two. And, and uh, you know, it didn't reflect the fact that today there was going to be a revolution in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. If anybody had noticed, the broadcast outlets had noticed the way they should have. There was not appropriate coverage, and there's been pitiful coverage of news and public affairs and what's going on in election races. In 2002, one study showed that half of all uh, news media outlets, broadcasters, had no coverage at all of the elections. Mostly what they did show was about horse races and who's up, who's down, who raised what money. You can't make decisions about the big issues in front of you unless you get better information from the media outlets, and it's their job, it's their obligation to do so. I challenged them. I asked them, just do five minutes a night for the 30 days before the election of candidate-centered discourse. This is something that a bipartisan commission asked them to do in 1998. And a handful of them agreed, and some of them actually almost did five minutes. Some of them did three, but that was a heck of a lot better than those that didn't agree at all. Can you spare five minutes for the public? They're going to take in $1.2 billion or more this year in political advertising, so you're going to see a flood of negative advertising, but are you going to get any coverage about the issues of concern to you? Can they afford in return for the free use of the airwaves where they're going to make all that revenue to give you back five minutes a night just for 30 days before the election? If they can't, 
then it's a sorry state of affairs, and I think it's going to be. I mean, is this going to turn around? One study showed that only one half of 1% of this primetime programming is community public affairs. But guess what? 14% is paid infomercials. So we may be getting tight abs, but we're getting a flabby democracy. <laughs> broadcasters need to give us more back. And we want to hear from you in Portland how well the broadcasters do, are doing here in this community. Are they serving your needs? Are local artists and musicians getting heard on the radio? Are you seeing, well, I guess we're getting the answers quickly here. Are you getting any positive stories, or is it all negative stories of violence and attacks and crime and dis disasters and nothing about the good things that happen in the community? The enriching things, the uplifting things that we can all learn from that are really reflective of what's happening in this beautiful city. Well, the FCC is about to launch an inquiry about how well broadcasters are doing in serving their local communities, and we need your input on that inquiry, as well as on this broader fight. And license renewals are coming up. If you don't think your broadcasters are doing a good enough job, the radio comes up in 2006 and TV stations in 2007, and it's your chance to say whether or not your local stations deserve to have their licenses renewed. Digital television rules are up for grabs right now. We've done all the technical rules to get the digital television transition in place, but guess what? Somebody forgot to do anything about the public interest rules. Somehow those have kind of slid into the background. Well, that can't happen anymore. The issue of what obligations broadcasters have when they go from analog to digital, and they go from one signal to five signals over the same space in the spectrum, you deserve to get something back when they get this giant free grant of spectrum. You have every right to deserve that something comes back to you and not just to the broadcasters who profit from them. What do you get out of it? Maybe it's time for the FCC to open up an inquiry on that. We've been pushing for that for years. We've got to make sure that when they have more capacity, something comes back to you, the public, not just to the bottom line of the broadcasters. And we're fighting on low power FM. Studies showed that it doesn't cause the interference we were told it is. So we need to get more stations in the hand of people. If you don't think you're getting enough diversity of viewpoints, let's get some more stations out there in the hands of the community. So there's so much more to do, and you'll be hearing tonight about that. And I sure appreciate the leadership of Free Press and all the organizers here tonight, City Club of Portland and CWA, and so many that did so much to bring this terrific example of what organizing can do with this, this great crowd here. I know you can make a difference if you keep up this fight. The courts gave us a second chance. Let's win it this time. I know you can make a difference for a fact because you already have made a huge difference and thank you for everything you've done. Oh, good. I'll know who I am now. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, please put your hands together once again for both Commissioner Cobbs and Commissioner Adelstein. I'm also in, about to introduce our panel, but before I do that, I want to make sure that you know that we do have representatives from our lo local, state, and federal government offices in the audience. We also have State Representative Diane Rosenbaum and State Representative Steve Marks, and we want to appreciate them being here and listening and supporting these efforts. So at this time, we're going to introduce our panel, and I'm going to go through, and I'm going to read the names of the panelists, and I'm going to go back and do a brief bio, and then the panelists will be free to, to have at it. Um, but I also want to make sure that you know that we had originally had scheduled Mary Lou Gunn, Vice President of Marketing and Manager with Clear Channel, and she'd agreed to be here, but unfortunately is stuck in a Los Angeles airport. And so we don't want the... <laughs> I feel the love, I feel the love. <laughs> and so we do have uh, David Lichen. He's the owner of Double T Concerts. The Unfair Use of the Public Airwaves will be the title of his presentation. We have Michael Powell, owner of Powell City of Books on Antitrust, Copyright, and Censorship. 
We have Andrea Cano of United Church of Christ, Justice and Witness Ministries on compliance with FCC EEO mandate. We also have Madeline Elder, president of CWA Local 7901, who will be talking about the perspectives from labor. So let me tell you a little about the people who will be speaking with you. David Lincoln has seen a lot of changes in Oregon's music scene since he started. Oregon's oldest and largest concert promotion outfit, Double T Productions, in 1972. In addition to having promoted countless concerts, including the largest music event in state history, this native son also found ticket seller Fast Tix and is the owner-operator of Portland's Roseland Theater. Michael Powell is the owner of Powell City of Books. It's been, not book, but books. <laughs> it's been said, if there's a new edition of the Bible, people expect God to be at Powell's to sign the books. <laughs> Indeed, Portland's Michael Powell has turned his father's bookstore into a city institution. Powell provides critical leadership to the artistic and civil liberties communities here over the years, serving on civic committees and boards too numerous to mention. Andrea Kano is the Western Regional Organizer for the United Church of Christ Justice and Peace Action Network. Prior to this post, she served as the director of the National Micro Radio Implementation Project. She began her career as a print journalist in Orange County, California, and worked in radio and television news in Los Angeles. As a Robert F. Kennedy Fellow, she served as the founding director of the California Chicano News Media Association, which fostered the creation of the National Association for Hispanic Journalists, now based in Washington, D.C. Madeline Elder started her tele telephony career <laughs> as an answering service operator and shop steward in 1974, and has been a telephone technician and union activist ever since. Currently, the president of Communication Workers of America 7901, Elder has also served as her local, her local as secretary treasurer and is an active supporter of Jobs with Justice. She earned her BA from the University of Michigan in 1989 and will receive a U LEAD certificate this summer from the University of Oregon Labor Education and Research Center. She lives with her life partner and two cats in North Portland. Please put a, your hands together and give a warm welcome to our panelists. Hi, my name is David Lichen. I'm president of Double T Concerts. I've been in business for over 30 years in Oregon. And I'd like to address commissioners, guests, and we the people. The central issue is that because of consolidation, control of the broadcast airways has transferred from the people to Wall Street and the banks. Consolidation of radio has led to sameness of format and presentation from market to market all across the country and fewer and fewer chances for exposure. The prime example is Clear Channel, owner of 1,200 plus radio stations in America. This is combined with control in excess of 70 to 80 percent of the concert industry, and this creates a situation where Clear Channel uses the airwaves for free to promote their events while forcing their competition to pay for the same and probably less promotion for a similar or same event. Clearly, that is unfair competition. Consolidation has led to higher advertising rates, and in the concert business, ticket prices, and artist guarantees have increased greatly. Artist guarantees in the last five to seven years at the arena level have probably tripled. Ticket prices, which were rarely over 50 to $60 top in most markets, are now routinely $125 to $150 top, and even hit $300 in, in some markets. The top artist guarantees were about $300,000 and now in many cases hit $500,000 and up to a million dollars per show. In many cases, Clear Channel will buy dates on these tours whereby the guarantee, ticket prices, 
and deals have no relevance to smaller markets such as Portland. This results in independent promoters being shut out of many situations that in the past were negotiated on a market by market basis. In other words, they will make their money in the major markets and yet freeze out the other promoters in smaller markets such as Portland because the risk reward factor means little or no chance of making a profit on the show. Then factor in the fact that according to SEC filings, Clear Channel receives $3.35 per ticket kickback from Ticketmaster, which are termed marketing fees, while its competitors receive significantly less or nothing, and one can begin to see the blatant unfairness of the situation. This is exactly the kind of practices that antitrust laws and fair trade laws were designed to stop. Then factor in one more stunner. Clear Channel has been biased in their treatment of artists who had the nerve to challenge them and play for the competition. They went so far as to remove artists from playlists, blacked out competitors' shows from their production schedules, and even required payment advance in advance for advertising. The fact that Clear Channel can deliver major airplay to artists as well as promote shows for free themselves while others pay for the same service flies in the face of what the FCC was meant to be. The FCC was to protect the public airwaves from the crass business practices I have just described. Consolidation has resulted in an entire group of entertainment entre entrepreneurs becoming its victims as well as the public. In the past, diverse ownership, at least at the radio broadcast level, has been the single factor most responsible for the creative presentation of varied radio formats. Consolidation further means public service with a financial agenda or a political one, and old-fashioned public service has disappeared forever. Just listen to the radio, which I do constantly, and you quickly realize that radio has changed forever because of consolidation. Media consolidation and clear channel is the result of a major mistake in policy and for sure the Justice Department should require the divestiture of the concert company. There is no way when you have five plus media properties in a market that another concert com promoter could possibly compete unless Clear Channel were required to make their airwaves available for free to their concert competitors. Media consolidation has made it possible for Clear Channel to effectively raise the cost of competing by raising prices and guarantees to a level no one else can match and still have a reasonable shot at making a profit, while its competition cannot compete equally. When it comes to media ownership rules, it needs to go back in time so the people help still have touch with the process. Right now, it's all about the greed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Powell. I gather there's some confusion about me and somebody else. Um, I guess if you need a point of differentiation, the one that I could point out is that, as far as I know, my father had never had a design on Iraq. <laughs> I'm here, I suppose, because I know something about the book business, and, and I constrain my remarks to that area. I don't. Uh, pretend any expertise outside of that world. Book production and distribution systems have experienced greater changes in the past decade than in any other period since Gutenberg. Concentration of publishing, distribution, and retailing have meant ever fewer decision makers determine what gets printed and where or if it will be sold. The majority of titles that the reading public can now select from originates from five publishing houses are distributed by two wholesalers to two primary retail chains and one online vendor. This concentration of traditional public, the concentration of traditional public, publishing in a handful of firms submerged in media conglomerates such as Time Warner, Bertelsmann, and Viacom means that these few cultures choose the author's voices that can be heard. This is also true for the retailing of books. Borders, Barnes and Noble, and Amazon exercise the cultural and economic sway over terms, manner, and availability of book selection. Once again, a lim limited number of business cultures make the selections. 
the same time, independent bookstores have declined in this decade from over 5,000 to just 1,800. With that decline, the opportunity for alternative placement and selection shrinks. Shrinks to such a point that alternative publishing is at risk of losing visibility. With these changes have occurred changes in business practices that blur the traditional book world. Publishers are selling direct to the customers, such as Penguin. Retailers are publishing. Barnes & Noble hopes within a year to be at 10% of their gross sales will be in books that they have exclusive control over. And authors are both printing and selling direct. The internet and low-cost telecom and database systems will accelerate these changes. The good news, I guess, soon if not now, no book need be out of print. Soon if not now, book text will be distributed to local, will be distributed to local on-site printing and binding devices. A decade from now, no element of the book world, save perhaps the author, will be as, as it is today. Only with thoughtful understanding of these trends will we arrive at a place that we're comfortable in being. Finally, books as other media live in a regulated world. Copyright, antitrust, and First Amendment interpretations will shape this world. Copyright restraints now serve as a formidable barrier to the movement of text across international boundaries. Business practices restricted on the internet, rest, restrained on the internet, if viewed differently from traditional practices, will either support a competitive level playing field or lead to a monopoly like powers. Our commitment, finally, our commitment to the First Amendment will either allow for the opportunity of all voices to be heard or will lead to a narrowing and silencing of some of these voices. Working in the shadow of the Patriot Act, child access laws, internet filters, tests our belief in the primacy value of ideas. Silencing of even one voice leaves in doubt the fullness of all discussion. Democracy's fundamental promise has been equal access to information. We will be judged by our continuing commitment to that promise. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, our guests, our listening public on KBU, our audience on public access. This evening, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the media advocacy work of the United Church of Christ on the theme of compliance with FCC equal employment opportunity rules. We applaud the Federal Communications Commission for its perseverance and steadfastness because the EEO rules are among the last whispers of public accountability answerable by the broadcasters. A mainline Protestant denomination, the United Church of Christ established its media advocacy commitment in 1959 through its Office of Communication, better known as OC Inc., as an outgrowth of the denomination's historic commitment to civil rights. Through the years, OC Inc. has sought to guarantee minimum hours of children's programming and fair rates from cable providers. We've also joined the numerous national organizations in defending the importance of the Fairness Doctrine brought formal action before the FCC about the egregious conduct of WorldCom, and most recently advocated for the creation and expansion of the low-power FM radio service for non-profit organizations. In the 1960s, the United Church of Christ earned its place in U.S. broadcast history by successfully challenging the license of WLBT-TV in Jackson, Mississippi for refusing to broadcast news and information about African Americans and for refusing to hire them when 40% of the community was, were African Americans. And it was precisely this petition that led to the original Equal Employment Opportunity Rules issued by the Federal Communications Commission for compliance by broadcasters throughout this nation. So, as the cultural demographics continue to multiply and diversify and even defy racial stereotypings and ethnic homogenization, we must continue to ask, perhaps rhetorically, like the good people at our at Benton Foundation in Washington, D.C., should the use of public-owned spectrum, like all of those radio and television channels, radio frequencies and ch TV channels, licensed to local broadcasters to serve the public interest, reflect the diversity of our communities? Since broadcast licenses give station owners the privilege and the power to air programming that exerts a powerful influence on our values and worldview and helps shape and inform public opinion about issues of public importance, 
Should those licenses come with the responsibility to assemble a staff that resembles the community that is served, and parenthetically, a staff that produces programs that reflect the diversity that is served. Since their inception in the late 1960s, the rules were essentially tied up with license renewals and their assessments. Annual employment records were submitted. Minimum percentages for employee women and minorities were set. Remember, Mary was hired in Minneapolis to work for Mr. Grant. Barbara Walters stepped down from the morning coffee clutch to the evening news. And a New York Street reporter, Jerry Rivers, was able to go back to his real name and as Geraldo Rivera became a big star. By 1987, the Commission changed its EEO focus to place greater emphasis on station efforts to recruit women and minority applicants. Essentially, the EEO rules were effective until a new Communications Act was crafted in 1996, greatly influenced by the broadcasters, and the relevance and enforcements of these rules began to diminish. Since that time, the EE rules have been in a fierce tug of war between the broadcasters and the FCC that even led to a suspension of the rules for a short while and license renewals were awarded virtually unchecked. And what were the consequences of all this dickering? The July-August issue of The Communicator, published by the Radio, Television, and News Directors uh, Association, featured the results of research that since 2002, the percentage of persons of color employed at broadcast stations had fallen significantly. The RTDNA attributed the slide to the temporary suspension by the FCC of its EEO rules. And statistics reported by Bob Papper in the article, Women and Minorities, One Step Forward, Two Step Backs, were dismal and dropping dramatically. The total TV news workforce, for example, showed 24.6 minorities in 2001 and a drop to 18% in 2003. And this doesn't even begin to look at the parity of the national demographics in which we live. So the total radio news workforce in 2001 was 10.75 in 2001 and 6.5 in 2003. TV general managers was 8.7 in 2001, 3.6 in 2003, and radio general managers 5.7 in 2001 and 2.5 in 2003. Well, these numbers and others speak for themselves, commissioners, and we ask three things of you. One, strengthen and enforce the EE rules, EEO rules. Two, create mechanisms within the agency for public participation in this type of oversight. Three, advise us how to offset the relentless challenges by the broadcast associations to diminish, eliminate, or delay implementation of the rules, or was done by the State Association of Broadcasters last month to halt the EEO audits of a sampling of radio and television stations with the Oregon Association of Broadcasters signing on to this. And four, lastly, create a mechanism of transparency which forces the broadcasters to go public with their actions before the FCC and the courts so that we have an opportunity to comment locally whether we agree or not. Perhaps we need kind of like a public emergency alert system <laughs> about this. But the good news is, in addition to today's court ruling against media consoli consolidation, is that the commission denied on Monday those state broadcasters, and I actually have the 10 pages of their request, uh, the commission denied their request to halt the EEO audits. But the bad news is that they plan another costly court challenge. So commissioners, know uh, that as you and your agency staff are as, as vigilant about the myriad of regulations, we will also be as attentive to our own responsibility as a public in shaping communications policy and its rightful and just implementation. Thank you. Um, my thanks to the commissioners for coming to Portland to listen to our concerns. We really appreciate your efforts to include citizens and not just corporations in this discussion. And I'm really excited to see so many people here from all spectrums of the community. The franchise right that cities grant to cable companies is their most valuable asset. Cities should insist on fair value for it. Based on the profits made from these franchises, companies have bought and sold and created giant corporations. As cable companies have grown larger and increased their geographic reach, they've gained more resources and power when they negotiate with cities. 
I would like to address four cable issues, cable service franchise fees, customer service, customer privacy, and of course, quality jobs. Comcast, like other co cable companies, has developed new services, high-speed internet and voice services, which are not subject to the automatic 5% franchise fee. It is projected by that year 2011. Oh, sure. Folks, I can't see. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is this on? Okay. It's projected that by the year 2011, only 60% of services offered by cable companies will be cable TV services. While Comcast value will skyrocket, the portion of cable revenue subject to the 5% franchise fee will shrink to 60% of what it is today. Thank you. Whatever the service delivered over cable, it, it should be subject to franchise fee. Without the franchise right, Comcast would not be able to make millions of dollars in profits in our communities. Customer service. On December 17, 2003, at a Metropolitan Area Communications Commission meeting in Washington County, Comcast Vice President of the Oregon Market spoke about the FCC call answer standard of answering customer calls within 30 seconds at least 90% of the time. He suggested that if it was lower to 82 or 85% of the time to answer these calls within 30 seconds, customers would not notice. Well, we think they would. <laughs> he added that it cost Comcast millions of dollars to maintain this current standard. We believe that millions of dollars translates into jobs. And we don't believe workers and customers should sacrifice so that Comcast can make more in profits. On the customer privacy policy, in May 2003, Comcast issued their customer privacy policy to Oregonians for the first time. Oregonians objected to Comcast's ability to share their personally identifiable information, such as social security, credit card, and driver's license numbers, with Comcast's unnamed legitimate business partners without prior approval from the customers. At the September 2003 Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission meeting, our local presented a petition with over 1,100 signatures gathered from citizens from around the city asking for a public hearing to address our concerns. At the same meeting, Comcast and the commission agreed that Comcast would revise the policy. By May of this year, customers began receiving the revised policy and the words of Gerard Lewis, Comcast Senior Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer. The point that bears making here is that the policy itself, that hasn't changed. What has changed is the notice itself. We've rewritten it to make it clearer. The concerns of the citizens of Portland were not addressed and not dealt with in good faith. Quality jobs. Corporations like Comcast have a responsibility to give back to communities to provide good quality jobs. Cable companies have chosen the low road, keep wages and benefits low, use lots of non-union contractors, and pressure employees to meet unrealistic productivity standards. Within the first year of Comcast's acquisition of AT&T broadband here, there were two statewide layoffs affecting over 150 workers. At, de at the December 2003 Metropolitan Area Communications Committee Commission meeting in Beaverton, Kurt Henninger, the vice president of the Oregon market, declared that, quote, we are going to wage a war to decertify the CWA, end quote. Decertification elections are supposed to come from the workers, not from management. In this case, Comcast announced their intention to violate labor law and sponsor a decertification campaign. They were successful in their efforts. In pursuit of their policy, Comcast campaigned to take away the union rights of technicians in Beaverton. Workers here were subject to daily anti-union meetings with management and day-long day -long ride-alongs with managers. Cable ratepayers paid for all this anti-union activity. There's been a coast-to-coast -coast assault on workers' rights unprecedented in the communications industry. This bullying of workers and the denial of their rights has not created the kinds of stable jobs that can build our communities. Some remedies we would suggest. First, the FCC should expand regulatory law to protect and enhance the rights of cities that negotiate franchise agreements. Second, allow franchise agreements to capture new revenue growth areas such as high-speed internet and voice services. Third, maintain the current call, call answer standard to ensure quality service for Oregon customers and jobs for our citizens. And fourth, continue to leave, 
local issues such as customer privacy in the jurisdiction of the local franchise authorities. Finally, the deregulation of the cable industry and the resulting consolidation has created virtual monopolies that bully the employees and deny them the right to improve their wages, benefits, and working conditions. The federal franchise granted at the community level allows Comcast to take tens of millions of dollars out of our community each year. Good jobs should be part of what we receive in return. Thank you so very much. If I could get you to give our, all of our panelists a, uh, a round of applause for the excellent job that they've done. You gotta love Oregon commissioners because not only do we tell you what the problem is, but we also tell you how to solve it. <laughs> We are getting into our open mic portion of our testimony. Let me explain to you how it will work. We will have uh, people lining up at the mics who have pre-registered uh, for this event tonight first. Um, and we have about 12 of those individuals that are gonna line up initially. And I will call those individuals by name and have them line up at the two mics that are, that are on both sides of the floor. Those of you who want to provide public testimony who have not signed in out in the lobby area, I would encourage you to do so because we are going to do this portion until 7.45, then we'll take a short break, and then we'll come back and there will be a second opportunity for public testimony. So if you don't get into the first group, don't worry, there will be time. And I also understand that anyone who wants to have testimony tonight will have an opportunity to have their two minutes to provide testimony. And so, without further ado, let me give you the names of the first individual, excuse me for a sec, a technical call. <laughs> Okay, forget everything I just said. That's not what's going to happen right at the moment. <laughs> I told you we're flexible here. You know, we can change in the middle of what we're saying. Um, actually, we, since we're so ahead of schedule and everybody's been so wonderful with time, what we've decided to do is give an opportunity for the commissioners to ask questions of the panelists based on what they've just heard. And so, without further ado, I will turn it over to the commissioners and they can ask questions to the panelists. Actually, I think what we did was uh, come out here to, to really hear from uh, the folks in the audience. I, I would just take one minute, though, to follow up on the uh, testimony of our good friend from the United Church of Christ, because this is uh, so important, what you're talking about, what's happened to my minorities in the age of consolidated media, and it's not good. You gave us the uh, statistics with the news workforce down 26 percent, the radio news workforce 39 percent, general managers and all. And 52% of the minorities employed in broadcasting work for the minority-owned stations. So if you go to the non-minority stations, the figures are even less. My feeling is that you cannot have diversity of viewpoint, diversity of minority viewpoint, without diversity of ownership and diversity of minority ownership. You know, it's really interesting. So many people think about uh, diversity as really a, a problem for, for this country to overcome when, in fact, diversity is a great strength of the United States of America, and it's, uh, it's our advantage. And our media have an obligation to reflect that diversity and an obligation to nurture that diversity, and big media especially has ignored that obligation, and I think it's really something we have to do. Now, you talked about EEOC. We really need to be pushy there, and uh, uh, yes, the broadcasters have, uh, have some uh, objections, some of them, to that. But we have a little bit too much caution within the FCC itself, too, on the EEOC, uh, uh, on the EEO rules. And I think, uh, 
you know, twice burned by the court, and they're so cautious now with this la latest set of rules that we came forth, and they're not as aggressive, they're not as outreaching as they should be, and I think we should be pushing the envelope more. So we really need for you folks, and, and you're doing a good job of this, but you just gotta keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing on this. We also have now this new diversity, it was a task force that uh, Chairman Powell has, has initiated to talk about uh, uh, how we can, uh, can help uh, on, on minority uh, representation and all. And I think that's nice, but again, that's one of those things that's really going to have to be pushed, and, you, and, and I'm, I'm encouraging them to reach out to the community at large and the non-traditional stakeholders, but I think you've, you've got to be pushy. We all have to be really pushy and say, we want some really solid results. Don't come with the same solutions from 10 or 15 years ago, but let's do something new. That's all I wanted to say, but I thank you for, for raising the point. Just one question. Uh, I had a very similar concern about that, but I want to, to uh, also talk to Madeline Elder about one thing. You made a lot of excellent suggestions for the FCC to consider about how to be more responsive to the public interest. With regard to, to cable, there's a pending matter before the FCC regarding the ownership rules. Not everybody might be aware of this, but two and a half years ago, the courts basically threw out a rule in front of the FCC that said that one cable company couldn't control more than 30% of the, the, uh, the cable eyeballs in this country. And they said, well, that's not justified. It's not 30%, so send it back to the FCC and come up with another number, be it higher, lower, presumably higher, the way the court wrote the, the draft. 30% is not enough for the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, apparently. Uh, and this is, of course, something that got buried for some reason after the outroar over, uproar over media ownership rules. Chairman Powell, the other Powell, uh, never brought it up. And so it's still pending before us. And the question is, what do you think? Do you think, um, what, what do you think we ought to do about the rule that says, right now there's no rule at all. I mean, a cable company could take over everything under our rules and uh, there'd be nothing in place to stop it. I think the FCC's got to take an action. But do you think we can uh, justify letting cable companies go even bigger than 30% of the country or? Uh, or should we get it, make it smaller and shrink it down to 20? Or what, what, what's CWA's view on that? Actually, CWA, um, CWA uh, saw that, well, Comcast is the second largest after Time Warner in terms of cable companies. And between them, they own practically all of it. It's very little that's left over in the market. Um, when Comcast went to the FCC because they were considering a merger with Disney, which was very frightening for us in terms of control of the wires, in terms of control of the content. Uh, CWA did go and we, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, stop that merger because we did see that as uh, not diverse. The, the three things that the FCC is charged with is diversity, localism, and competition. And the, that, that sort of merger would have gone totally against those three principles. And I think that, um, you know, Communication Workers of America has been really fighting uh, to, stop, to stop that, um, to stop that sort of uh, consolidation. And in fact, um, and in fact, we have gone to Washington, D.C. and have done that. So thank you very much for pointing, pointing that out. Well, thank you. You remembered everything I told you, right? So you already know what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Okay, I'm going to tell the people who they are that are going to come up to the mics. And we're going to get this, we're going to start this process. We have Alan Bushong and Bill Malley. I mean, I'm sorry, McNally, if they will come to the mic here. And then we have Carl... We have Carrie Kickle and Carl, thank you. I hope he's already there. Okay, so we'll have two at this mic and two over at this mic. In the front, we have someone that has a one minute warning and a 30 second warning, no, 30 se she has a 30 second warning, so when you get to 30 seconds, she will let you, she'll hold up the sign and I will say thank you when your time is up. <laughs> and I will use my former legislative voice to say that if I have to say it more than once. So, okay, without further ado, we will move on. Thank you. I remember that, Representative Bowman. Uh, my name is Alan Bushung. I'm director of the non-commercial nonprofit Capital Community Television in Salem, Oregon. 
I'm, I want to thank the commissioners for traveling 50 times farther than the 50 miles that I did to get here. And thank you for your second trip. I, I remember you March 7 last year in Seattle. Um, I live in the largest state ca uh, capital community in the nation without broadcast network affiliates or FM radio, over 200,000 people. Talk about being left behind. I want to ask you for three favors. Support localism in television, radio, and internet, all electronic media by providing public space and local regulation. The cable model works because local officials we have impact on. When the decisions go to Washington, except for you two people, and when they go to the state capitol, except for a couple of the people here, our voices are drowned out and lost. Second, require compensation from the people that are making so much money from the use of the public airwaves and use that to support the public space and, and cut in broadcast uh, direct satellite also because if they can get a bill to the home, they can get a local signal to the home and they can also pay for the use of the airwaves. And finally, open up the hoarded, overguarded media. And low power FM is such a great example. The third adjacent rule cuts us out. There's no FM radio in Salem. We can't get a local, uh, an LPFM license. Think of it as a seven lane interstate with a big triple trailer driving down the center. And the, another semi can go uh, with just one open lane on either side, but in our little compact cars, we can't get, get on the lane at all. And the supreme irony would be for us to get out emergency information we're on a generator. We have emergency personnel from Salem 300 feet away, but we can't get a frequency to reach what might be the only way to communicate the, AM or the radio battery powered. Please help us and we'll help you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Carrie, you'll be next. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be heard this evening. My name is Carrie Kekel, and um, as a public relations professional, I've worked with local media for more than 20 years and for the last 13 years have served as the Director of Public Relations for the Oregon Symphony. I have witnessed firsthand how the trend away from local ownership of electronic media has resulted in dramatically reduced coverage of the arts and a growing lack of public service support for events of importance and interest to our community. I am told on a regular basis that coverage of the symphony is no longer a priority for local news. I am told that assignment editors are instructed to seek stories about violence, crime, scandal, and sex abuse, and are told not to cover soft news. I am told that one local station is contractually bound to do a news story every day that connects to the theme of a nationally syndicated talk show. I am told that television promotion of important community events now comes with a hefty price tag as opposed to a desire to be a good community partner. As a result, electronic media coverage of the Oregon Symphony has declined 50% in each of the last two seasons. That figure is more compelling when you consider that those seasons celebrated our longtime music director James DePriest and welcomed his successor, Carlos Calmar. In addition, this year for the first time in history, we will be asked to pay for local television promotion of the symphony's free public concert at Tom McCall Waterfront Park, an annual event that draws more than 30,000 community members. Decisions about local media are being made by out-of-town executives who don't value our quality of life and community spirit. Please bring the conscience back to our media by insisting on local ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Are you Bill? You're Bill, okay. If you could hold at the mic for just a moment and I'll name the next four people and have two come to this mic and two to that mic. That will be Francis Baker, J.J. McKay, Joella Worlin, and Jonathan Lawson. If you could line up two on this side and two on the other side, that would be great. Your turn, sir. Good evening. I'm Carl Kucharski. I'm the Executive Director of Portland Community Media. 
Portland Community Media, a nonprofit organization, has served our community for more than 23 years, providing tools, training, and transmission to individuals, churches, businesses, governments, and nonprofit organizations that wish to use the cable television system as a means of communication, empowerment, and community development. Portland Community Media has served literally thousands of individuals and organizations who have produced tens of thousands of hours of local community television programs in dozens of languages, 45,000 hours in just the last six years alone. Um, with strong support from our local elected officials, Portland Community Media and the community were able to accomplish all of that because in the early 70s and the early 80s, first the FCC and then Congress were far-sighted enough to establish public service obligations such as channels, some financial support for public education and government access operations on cable television systems. Communi communities all over the country have taken advantage of that un the unique opportunities offered by PEG Access. Unfortunately, the vision of public, ser public interest services in the media has become nearly blinded by the never-ending search for the ever-elusive synergies in media mega-mergers. Be that as it may, Portland Community Media has five recommendations for the FCC and elected officials um, at all levels of government that we believe will promote democratic discourse. One, strengthen and improve the public interest obligations in cable television franchises by requiring adequate channel capacity, bandwidth, funding, and other resources for PAG access organizations. Two, require fair compensation for the use of public rights of way and the use of the electromagnetic spectrum. Three, require all electronic media, regardless of delivery medium, to provide public interest services like PEG access with adequate channel capacity, bandwidth, and funding and support services. Four, revise the rules for low power FM radio and low power television so that many more community owned stations may be licensed quickly. Five, require broadcast television stations to return their analog frequencies so that those frequencies may be redistributed to local community for public interest services. Portland Community Media would be pleased to work with the FCC and elected officials to establish vibrant public interest services in all media. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, it's your turn. Hi, I'm Bill McNally. I'm the operations manager here at Music Millennium. We're a 35-year-old record store based here in Portland. Uh, the deregulation of radio killed the ability for many artists to get their music played. Large radio groups such as Clear Channel control what is played on the air. Pay-to-play marketing money controls pay playlists. The conglomerate control uh, uh, to get played in a marketplace and possibly translate to other markets if successful. This cannot happen anymore. The same records get played on like stations in each market as controlled by the conglomerate. The public gets exposed to less of the art of music and recording artists have less chance to uh, expose have their music heard, excuse me. Uh, September 11th was a great example of the negative effect of what a conglomerate can do. They chose many songs to delete from their playlists, like John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance. Were they sending a pro-war message by doing that? They have the power to influence a great percentage of the population with politics and other major issues in subtle ways. If it is not stopped, the future of only a few artists will prosper and the citizens of America will only be exposed to the likes of the conglomerates which anymore is a very homogenized sound in all formats they play and represents less than 1% of diversity of music in any of these formats. We need to stop this now. Thank you. <laughs> Joella, you're next. I'm Joella Worland. As public affairs director for Portland's ABC affiliate from 1979 to fall 93, my job was to address community interests through local public service programming campaigns and PSAs. The GM who hired me was a principled, tough-minded businessman who pushed the station to first place in the 1980s. He also conveyed keen awareness of the public trust. In his poetic words, I was keeper of the flame, meaning that I had better damned well guard our FCC license. After leaving KATU, then City Councilman, now Congressman Earl Blumenauer appointed me to the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission and later to the Board of Portland Cable Access. As Board President, I had a leading role in launching CityNet 30, a local government and public affairs channel. Now, as a citizen with no vested role, I see the real effects of deregulation. Consider some relevant facts. 
In market size, Portland ranks 24, but not one of our TV stations is locally owned. Our daily newspaper, almost all major radio stations, businesses, and banks are headquartered out of state, a reality that negatively affects local investment and outlook. These then are my points. One, FCC oversight does matter. Regulation is an expression of public values. Following rules changes in the late 80s, I saw public outreach become a hollow concept, except as it might boost revenue and ratings. And in this sense, I support Carrie Keyhole's experience. Two, the FCC must defend local cable franchise regulations and access channels. Our region has been fortunate for vigilant franchise protection by local governments, but each franchise transfer has been embroiled in battle. Three, to guard against a Walmart-style appetite for media ownership consolidation, I suggest assessing substantial spectrum use fees for TV station ownership on any commercial entity that already has a station or holds a cable franchise in the same community. Cross ownership of a daily newspaper and TV station in a single market must always be prohibited. Thank you. Francis Baker, President of the League of Women Voters of Portland. I'd like to thank both of the commissioners for coming here and listening to the public on this very important issue. The Portland League is actively involved in local issue advocacy. Our organization is involved in decisions related to affordable housing, urban renewal, planning, clean money campaigns, and police accountability. We believe governmental decisions at every level are strengthened by the informed and active participation of citizens and that good information is essential to effective public participation. There are a few bright spots in Portland in terms of public media, commercial media. KGW-TV has a city hall reporter. KATU runs an occasional town hall program that focuses on public policy, and Kink FM devotes airtime to local issues. Generally speaking, however, on the rare occasion when a local station does cover a city issue, the reporter assigned to it has no background or understanding of the topic, so the story lacks the depth needed for full public understanding. Overall, broadcast media in Portland devote little or no attention to issues going on at City Hall. Our elected officials are making decisions that affect the lives of ordinary citizens, including public investment in affordable housing projects, improvements to transportation infrastructure, and the circumstances under which police officers can fire their weapons. Individuals who rely solely on commercial radio and TV for their information lack the background needed to fully understand the basics of local public policy decisions. On the evening news, we see an apartment fire but we never hear about the tremendous lack of affordable housing in Portland. We see a five-car pileup on the freeway instead of a story on the city's road maintenance backlog. Democracy depends on an educated public that participates by offering informed opinions to their elected representatives. It is incumbent upon the broadcast media to provide, among other things, in-depth coverage of local issues in return for their use of public airwaves. We urge you to advocate for adoption of licensing requirements that include this obligation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Mary Simpson and Pat Vummer to come to this mic and to invite Rosie Stevens and Scott Robinson to come to the mic on this side. Thank you, sir. You may go. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Lawson. I'm here representing Reclaim the Media in Seattle. I want to express our solidarity for CWA, the IBEW, and the tens of thousands of unrepresented workers for Comcast and Clear Channel who do not have the benefits of union protection. And I'm here tonight to enter into the public record of the FCC's uh, proceedings, the Seattle Statement on Radio. The commissioners already have copies, and there are copies available at the testimony table for other people who are interested. In February, Reclaim the Media, along with another, a number of other groups in Seattle, convened a public forum on fixing radio. We envisioned uh, the forum as a community-based discussion on media ownership and localism issues. We had the idea that the airwaves belong to us and that our communities have the knowledge and experience needed to assess whether our airwaves are being used in a way that serves our culture and our democracy. We don't need to, be at, we don't need to wait to be asked. We don't even need to wait for the FCC to come and have a hearing. 
Our panelists represented the establishment media. We even had a couple of representatives from Clear Channel who were invited and accepted, but then uh, weren't able to show up. Perhaps they were stuck in a LA airport. <laughs> Community radio, unions, uh, musicians, people from the recording industry, uh, listeners, of course, and public interest advocates. And together we worked for two days and came up with uh, what we have in the statement, a list of recommendations to Congress and to the FCC that we hope will help to fix radio. We have recommendations in several areas. Content, such as requiring or incentivizing local news coverage of issues and elections. Artists' concerns, including ending pay for play and getting local artists access to local airwaves. Accountability and disclosure, uh, putting teeth back into the li license renewal process for radio stations. Requiring stations to disclose on-air voice tracking and who their owner is. Spectrum allocation, low power FM, of course, which is now in the Congress's hands, the FCC has officially gotten behind LPFM again. Establishing a strong public interest obligation for digital broadcasting. And lastly, and probably most importantly, ownership protections. Reestablishing, re the reestablishment of strong ownership caps and the breakup of the largest conglomerates. I'll close just with uh, one little quotation from the statement. Radio is the most local and ephemeral of our media with a special ability to engage and expand both our imaginations and our sense of community. If our radio today is, fail is falling short of its potential, it lies within our power to change it for the better. The contemporary radio landscape has been primarily shaped not by some natural order of things, but by an ongoing history of public policy decisions. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Can you move the mic? Can you move closer to the mic? Like this? Yes. Okay. My name is Mary Simpson, and I'm an employee of the telephone company. I know that voice over internet protocol, in, the, in other words, the ability to make phone calls by using my computer, is going to change the telecommunications industry. But I do have concerns about the obligations of these carriers. I live in Oregon City, and occasionally we do lose electrical power. I'm still able to use my landline telephone service because my central office has battery backup systems that are required by the regulations for network reliability. I once had a chimney fire and I had to call 911. Within minutes, the fire department was at my house. If I had been too panicked to give my address, the 911 operator would still have been able to dispatch emergency workers due to enhanced 911 service. What would happen if I only used my computer for telephone service? Would I still have that same quick response? Another concern is privacy of the network. Right now, I have to be concerned about spyware when using my computer, but the telephone company has to get a court order for a wiretap to listen to my private conversations. I have to buy software to protect my computer from viruses or possibly from spam email, but right now the telephone company provides all the security to keep my telephone conversations private, especially when I do my banking over the telephone. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, commissioners, for coming. My name is JJ McKay, but actually my real name is Janine Jolliker Wells. That's just not as cool. And I'm a broadcaster and former radio station owner. I retired from broadcasting in August of 2001, large, largely due to deregulation and my inability to be competitive against large corporations in the radio industry. I got into broadcasting in 1981 as an on-air talent while going to college. I started out at a small radio station in the middle of a cow pasture in Cocoa, Florida, where I would have to kick snakes out of the transmitter room to take readings. During the 777 ownership rule, I had many opportunities to develop my skills and was enriched by the different ideas that were expressed due to the large part of diversity of media ownership. I became successful on the air and worked full time at large stations for 10 years. In the early 1990s, I realized that if I was going to continue to grow as a broadcaster, I would need to become independent as the options for freedom of expression became more and more limited due to the new media ownership rules. That proved to be a smart move, and soon I was able to create and syndicate programming throughout the Northwest and eventually nationally. In the early 90s, radio station ownership was still quite diverse, so clearing programming was not difficult. By developing my business skills, I was able to secure venture capital and purchase my first small radio station in 1998. 
By being a station licensee, I finally felt that I could express my vision and ideas. The first station got ratings, and in 1999, I acquired a second radio property. I created a new and innovative format and felt like I was on my way. I wrote about that format in national magazines and regularly had conversations about programming with a number of broadcasters, including executives from Infinity Radio owned by CBS. On July 1st, 2001, Infinity Radio contacted me stating that they were pulling the programming off my radio station. I was to learn that this tact was to use to copy the format that I had created and to duplicate the concept on CBS stations across the country. With the radio station gutted, I had no choice but to sell the stations at a loss in order to avoid bankruptcy. Sorry. Without a huge legal staff to, f to fight this injustice, I realized that any opportunity that I was to have with the current licensee laws was slim to none. And I was not the only casualty in this process. But the real tragedy in deregulation has been the constant eroding of the First Amendment through the gross misuse of the airwaves, which contrary to popular belief are not owned by five large, large corporations, but by the people of the United States. If we treated our national parks in the same way we treat our airwaves, there would only be five guys driving around in Hummers at Yellowstone. <laughs> This monopoly of media has severely limited the freedom of expression in America. Thousands of jobs in broadcasting have been lost due cons to consolidation, and advertising sales opportunities are almost non-existent for small commercial operators. I ask you to please restore the sane regulation of media and limit ownership to encourage fair and ethical competitive practices and to allow affordable choices for access of the airwaves to our citizens and to restore the airwaves to the rightful owners, the people of the United States. Thank you. Clearly, the issues we're dealing with tonight are really emotional issues. It, it hits near and dear to all of our hearts. So my, my empathy goes out to JJ, because I definitely understand how difficult it is to stand up and talk like that. And so we'll go to this mic next. Commissioners, I'm Patricia Rumer, an activist with more than 30 years of experience in Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. I organized the Oregon chapter of Jubilee USA Network in 1999, formerly known as Jubilee 2000 a national coalition of more than 60 labor, environmental, religious, and women's organizations representing millions of U.S. citizens. Jubilee, a global movement in more than 60 countries, seeks to cancel the debt of the world's poorest countries in Africa and Latin America to the IMF and the World Bank. And I want to speak very briefly about what it means to work on a global issue in a local area and what happens in terms of the media. I'm active in Jubilee because African women in Zimbabwe asked me to use my influence as a U.S. citizen to change the destructive IMF and World Bank policies. I have seen firsthand the devastating impact on people's lives from IMF-imposed structural adjustment policies resulting in cutback in health care, education, and farm subsidies. Jubilee Oregon works with African, Caribbean, and Latin American immigrant communities, labor and environmental organizations to advocate for debt cancellation. Congressmen Blumenauer, DeFazio, and Wu have supported Jubilee initiated legislation, and nationally we've drawn support from politicians as diverse as Jesse Helms and Dennis Kucinich. We must be doing something right. <laughs> Locally, Jubilee programs and events have received limited media coverage. The Oregonian newspaper did cover the visit of Nobel Peace Laureate Andolfo Perez Esquivel, but no TV or radio. In 2000 and 2002, we brought prominent African leaders to talk about the impact of debt. Only the local community access cable station covered their presentation. 
During the recent G8 meetings in the U.S., there was no local coverage in Oregon and only limited national coverage from a new debt proposal from Prime Minister Blair. Debt payments kill people. The impact of HIV AIDS is a greater threat than terrorism. It's estimated three million people will die in Africa this year from HIV and AIDS. Where is the media? The concentration of media nationally and globally means less opportunity for alternative voices to be heard, the voices of the poor globally, and voices calling for justice in the United States, immigrants, working class people, ecumenical religious groups, and women who struggle for change at home and in the world. We need greater access, not less. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask Sharon Genesi to come to the mic on this side, Sue Disciple, and Tim Nesbitt, if you could come to the mic on the other side. You'll be all prepared to testify. You're next, sir. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Scott Robinson, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Portland Public Schools. I'm pleased to be here this evening to share with you one of the many positive outcomes that can be attributed to the degree of collaboration resulting from proactive regulatory oversight and local control of the cable franchise. As a K-12 public school system in Oregon, we, like most school systems, are seriously challenged to provide modern technology services in support of our educational mission. We have many aging buildings, we have declining funding, and provision of those kinds of technology services to our student populations is extremely difficult. And as a service provider within K-12, we strive to stretch our meager resources through leveraging partnerships with both private and public entities. The most recent example of that was with the City of Portland and the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. The thoughtful leadership and local regulatory oversight of the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission over cable franchise rights yielded the development of the institutional network, or INET. The INET provides connectivity, network connectivity, to over 100 Portland public school buildings, and through a collaborative endeavor of the City of Portland's Ernie Network, created an opportunity to access high-speed bandwidth at an affordable price. This opportunity was created through the stewardship of the MHCRC in creating a franchise fee structure which allowed use of public right-of-ways for for-profit enterprises while creating a much-needed fund to reinvest in public purposes such as ours. Through the MHCRC-guided interconnection of the INET and Ernie Networks, Portland Public Schools has been able to reduce bandwidth costs from $180 per megabit to just over $5 per megabit. As, an import, as important, the total bandwidth each school has moved from 1.5 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second. Without this dramatic reduction in price and increase in speed, high bandwidth would not have been affordable and the services that we need to provide would not have been capable of being provided. Provisioning this type of high-speed bandwidth is essential to core curriculum tools that drive modern schools, including high-speed internet access for research, distance learning opportunities to connect to the rest of the world, stream digital content, and online collaboration tools, including voice-supported applications. Without the regulatory oversight and the franchise management of the MHCRC locally, we would not have been able to access these services through our existing cable provider. 